please join me in giving Jeffrey Tucker a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. I first have to apologize for my voice. My voice is usually very lovely and sonorous and fabulous to listen to. Unfortunately, today it's a little gravelly and uh, so gravelly and awful. And, but there's a reason for it. So if you don't mind, I'll tell you this strange story of how my voice came to sound like this. I was just in San Francisco. And I gave what I think was the best speech of my life. I mean, it was one of those inspired nights. I don't know, it could have been the gin. I, I'm not sure what happened, but for whatever reason, I gave a really, I mean, just an except, exceptional lecture. And, and this lady came up to me afterwards, and she was just in, in tears, right? You want to move people like that. That's a wonderful thing when it happens as a speaker. So she threw her arms around me and implausibly kissed me right on the lips, which is a little alarming. And she had tears in her eyes. And I said, I'm so touched by this attitude of yours. Thank you. And she stepped back and I said, you know, uh, there seems to be a sign on your neck. What does it say? She said, oh, it says, um, I have laryngitis and I'm contagious. <laughs> True story. So I had some sense that I might get laryngitis. <laughs> and sure enough, the next day on the plane home, every time I put my head back on the chair, I would kind of, <coughs> <coughs> you know, I felt a little something. And so here I stand before you now, Friday night, uh, trying to get over this problem. So again, my apologies. But I'm very excited to talk to you about what I think is the most exciting economic development, well, let's just say it, in all of history. Uh, and it's the, the advent of the peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy, which is fundamentally changing our economic structures every day in ways that don't make the headlines. So you're not going to read about it in the cover of the New York Times. Uh, I think that it, it is the, the awesome thing that's happening. It really began with the digital age, which I, I think of as starting in 1995. That was the invention of the web browser. And the great thing that happened between 95 and 2000 is we began to develop tools to communicate with each other directly instead of going through mediating forces all the time. Um, so we could buy and sell with each other. So I'm sure you've used eBay, right? Uh, you know, the, it's sort of a garage sale for the world. Um, that that's, it was and is still an awesome thing. Uh, one of the things about these peer-to-peer -peer economic structures is they reveal to us the true value of, of what we own. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I remember early in the days of, uh, of, of eBay, um, I, I, I had several treasured possessions, one of which was a toaster that my grandmother gave me that was a gift on her wedding day. And I loved it, but I loved it a lot. Truly, I did. But I was kind of tired of carrying it around everywhere. So I thought, well, I'm just going to sell this. So I went on eBay and was ready to list it. And I, and I thought, well, maybe I'll check and see if there's another toaster like this, which there surely is not. Well, I found about, oh, 300 of them. And the average price, selling price was $3. So yeah, I decided I would keep it, really, it, rather than try to sell it. Anyway, so we find out all sorts of things about the world uh, through these peer-to-peer -peer economic te technologies. Um, uh, and, and we're discovering more all the time. Uh, how many of you have used Air Airbnb in this room? Has anyone used Airbnb? Yes, OK, so it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, these kinds of technologies, what they do is they take unused resources and they find markets for them. So if you have an extra room in your house, and you decide you want to rent it out, you can, you can make that available and judge the people who are going to come and stay with you based on their own ratings. So the peer-to-peer -peer economy very much works on a, on a reputation basis. And, and it's remarkable how much is changing everything. Airbnb is fundamentally challenging things like zoning laws, which you've, if you've ever had to build anything in a city, you have to deal with a zoning board. Well, Airbnb doesn't care about zoning boards, and nobody can stop them. 
Um, it's a very interesting thing how uh, it's, it's made new housing available in New York and, and all over the country. Jackrabbit is one of my favorite services. That if, if I'm good at, at fixing sinks, I can list my, my, my services on Jackrabbit. And people can um, uh, employ me. If I do a good job, they give me a high rating. Uh, I don't have to worry about uh, occupational licensing or these sorts of things. These, 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 these technologies are helping us get around some of the problems we have in this country with too much government regulation. And they're affecting everything. Uh, lots of freelancers in this country now are figuring out ways to, instead of going to work for a big corporation and, and uh, receiving W-2 income, they've found that just by registering on something like Elance or Odesk, they can get enough business to, to make a go of it. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary thing how P2P has, has changed the world. And, and unfortunately, politicians are starting to notice a little bit. Um, uh, one of, uh, how do I put this? There's a certain candidate for, for president, uh, uh, the front runner in the Democratic uh, Party. Uh, has decried the rise of the sharing economy. And she says she wants to redefine these contractors as employees, you know. Well, that would completely shatter this economic model. I mean, it would just completely shatter it. So there's, um, we, <laughs> more than anything else, I, I want to keep the politicians out of this sector. Uh, I just, like, just, just leave us alone, you know, just, things are going well. Uh, by the way, I'm generally of this opinion that things are going pretty well, that my biggest worry is things like elections, actually. You know? um, that's all we need is a new president with a mandate and a vision. You know, I, I think <laughs> if we just kind of s keep the status quo, uh, we're going to break them down. Um, an example of what's happening, uh, when I was in San Francisco, well, first I got invited to speak at Google, which was an awesome thing. Uh, to, to be at Google. I, I don't know if other people feel this way, but I have uh, like a deep love, like Eros, you know, sort of feelings towards Google. So to get invited there to speak was, was awesome. And then later I took a tour of Uber, uh, which is the ride sharing service that we, I'm almost certain that we have Uber here in Wichita. I'm almost certain of it, yeah. Last year, last October, I asked the clerk at the front desk of the hotel, um, uh, I need to get down to, I need to get somewhere, should I take an Uber? And she says, well, I'm sorry, we don't have that. And I said, well, um, gosh, do you have taxis? Yes. How long will it take? About 45 minutes. I said, well, okay. And so just on a lark, I decided to pull up the Uber app. There were five cars waiting for me within a square mile. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm sure it's more advanced even now. But listen, here's the beautiful thing. I, I, I wish that you could all do what I, what I did this last week. Go into the offices of Uber, and here you have all the nerds from high school that you used to make fun of. They're all gathered in a room, uh, in one room, and they're all typing quietly on their computers with earbuds listening to techno rock or whatever. And, um, and they're following, uh, following ride sharing going all, on all over the world. People who want to drive, people who want rides, making sure that they're able to, to link up with each other and, and, and make an economic exchange. And as I looked over that room, I thought, look at this room. Look at this room. Just a few hundred people destroying government monopolies all over the world. So, you know, this, this is a peaceful revolution, right? No muskets, no uniforms, no bugles, uh, you know, or anything like that. Just geeks typing on computers. We got it. We got this one covered. Uh, you know, and uh, in New York is a good example because they have this this tremendous racket, you know, of, of, of cabbies. I don't know if you've been to New York and tried to take one, but, you know, you take your life in your hands. Um, the medallion sold only last year for a, a million dollars, uh, the right to, to drive somebody in New York cost you a million dollars. The last posted price was six months ago and is now $600,000, which is... Which is uh, the prices tell you everything, don't they? Uh, except I don't believe that figure because there's been no sale uh, or buy of a New York taxi cab medallion in six months. So it's very possible that the value of those medallions has fallen to zero. You know, this is all, how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, we put out position papers, we wrote op-eds, we wrote letters to the editor, we lobbied and everything, but none of that did any good. What it took was entrepreneurship. It took innovation. It took, it took a, a brilliant entrepreneur 
to see that there was a way around the regulations and to using mobile technology to make it possible. And my friends, I think we're just at the beginnings of this revolution. It's the most exciting thing um, in the world today, what mobile applications are doing to our economic structures. So uh, one of the reasons I was invited was to talk about Bitcoin, and I hope by saying that word you stay interested, because sometimes the word Bitcoin uh, makes people uh, get bored because immediately the speaker plunges into um, uh, uh, you know all sorts of technological uh, detail and uses terms you can't understand. So I'm going to do that <laughs> right now. I don't know how else to do it. Uh, here's 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 what happened with Bitcoin. Ever since the digital age began, people have wanted a money. So it's fine to be able to exchange goods and services over the internet, but. It, Unless you have a, a, a money that's specially made for uh, geographically non-contiguous exchange, uh, that's instant, that's easily transferable and cheap to move, you're always going to have to use this old-fashioned money that the government invented uh, a long time ago. That doesn't work very well. It's very expensive to move. Um, it takes a lot of days. ACH, you know, if you've ever used it, is a system out of the 19, I don't know, 50s or something like that. We're still using credit cards on the internet, which are just remarkably insecure, uh, very expensive. The other thing about national money is it's very vulnerable to uh, manipulation by political elites. Like in this country, we have these, we have this Politburo of, of unelected bankers who who are in charge of the dollar, called the, the Federal Reserve, and which is a very strange thing to have in, in, a, in a country that allegedly values private enterprise. Um, so many people for a long time have been trying to work on this problem of how do you make a new money for the internet. And um, I have to tell you, I was a skeptic. I didn't believe you could really do it because one of the things about the inter internet is that um, anything that appears on it can be reproduced instantly, right? You know, like a, a trillion times instantly. That's part of the beauty of the internet. Well, it turns out when it comes to money, you really don't want that, actually. You want there to be uh, a strict, because after all, if you do that, then you just have the Federal Reserve all over again. Yeah, I mean, uh, so you want strict limits on the quantity of money. So the great, there were a number of great uh, technological uh, hurdles to get over and trying to make a Bitcoin. So there was a programmer, and we don't really know his name. Uh, he goes by the name Satoshi Nakamoto. In 2008, right in the midst of this big uh, crisis, you remember, we had a big crisis in this country because housing prices began to fall. You know? And you know, all the big banks were heavily invested in mortgage-backed securities, uh, you know, all levered up, and just a slight change in the algorithms that, that governed their buying and selling. Uh, you know, put their portfolios into upheaval, uh, leading to billions and trillions of losses. And it had the entire political and banking establishment panicked. And George Bush got on television and said things like, look, we have to, we have to immediately allocate $400 billion to bailing out all these big shots, or you are going to find yourself going to the ATM, and it will be, there'll be no cash there in it for you, you know? So it seemed like at that moment in history, our money wasn't working very well. So Satoshi Nakamoto put out a white paper in October of 2008 uh, where he proposed a new ledger-based system. It would be a ledger in the sky that everybody in the cloud where everybody could observe what was going on at that, on that ledger. And you could enter the, into the ledger and leave the uh, ledger by, um, uh, through a passcode uh, that would be protected cryptographically. And the ledger, though it existed as a purely internet protocol, would kind of work like the gold standard. So if you used your CPU power to process and verify transactions and, and watch the ledger, make sure there wasn't any double counting, uh, make sure that it was always perfectly balanced, then you would be rewarded with the first fruits of, of the algorithm itself, which produced uh, units that he called Bitcoin. And you'd become an owner and be able to spend them. So uh, just a brilliant and implausible system. It seemed crazy. And in fact, not that many people cared about it. Right? I was sent articles on this subject in late 2009 where people were trying to convince me of it. And I thought, uh, you're out of your minds. This thing can't possibly work. Well, the first Genesis block of Bitcoin came out January of 2009. 
And, and almost every day between then and October of that year, there were uh, various geeks hammering on the system to see if it really worked, if they could keep up with all the transactions, to see if the blockchain really worked the way it was supposed to. And there were a lot of tweaks to the system, many different uh, changes made to the code because the, the code itself is a community effort. And then a remarkable thing happened on October 5th, 2009. Uh, Bitcoin, the numeraire, that governed the protocol itself, obtained a value. The first posted value for Bitcoin was one sixteenth of a penny. And it was a beautiful day, because on that day, uh, internet money was invented. It is a proof of concept, a remarkable thing, that now for the first time in the history of the world, we had something as perfect as a gold standard without the downside of the gold standard, which is that gold weighs a lot and that it takes a lot of time to move. Bitcoin is just like gold, except it's waste, weightless and it takes, no, it takes up no space. And it can be transmitted peer-to-peer -peer electronically for anybody who has a smartphone, from anybody who has a smartphone to any other smartphone instantly. Um, it was a few years before I became a true believer uh, I was surrounded by a bunch of Bitcoiners one time at a conference who had trapped me in the hall. And they said, we are going to take you to lunch. And I thought, I can't imagine anything worse in the world than being surrounded by Bitcoiners for lunch. But I am also not rude, so I will agree to this. It turns out all those people are billionaires, by the way, but um, I didn't know that at the time. And, and I had my suitcase with me. And uh, they, they had me download a blockchain wallet. And they explained to me that, that Bitcoin really is to uh, old money, old fashioned money, what email is to the old letter. It's just a, the newest advance. It's the coolest thing. It's much better than regular money. Um, and I said, well, how do I get it? And they said, well, how about this? You sell us some bow ties. And so I reached into my bag and I pulled out three bow ties and I calculated them at $60 a piece. Uh, I didn't want to sell them because <laughs> I, I like bow ties. Um, but I sold them for, uh, for uh, Bitcoin, I think, was, was uh, something like $10 at the time. Uh, so I made a lot of money, actually, in <laughs> retrospect from that transaction. Um, and I felt it arrive on my phone. It was just a, a feature of the wallet I happened to download that your phone buzzes when you get the Bitcoin. But I felt it. I mean, I had this emotional pull you know, on me. I was like, wow, something epic just happened. I got home and I thought, now that I have these ridiculous Bitcoins, I wonder what I can do with them. I went online and went shopping. And I, I found a thing called the Bitcoin store and I bought the first thing I could find, which was a pair of crimping pliers. Um, I, I didn't really think this was going to work. A QR code came up. Uh, I held up my phone to the screen. Uh, it, it sucked in the code, uh, typed in a public address, I pushed one button, and a few seconds later my, 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 uh, my bill was paid. And then a few days later, the crimping pliers arrived um, in the mail. But I could feel it at that moment when the money left my, my wallet and went into the screen and landed on some other, uh, some other place, and the person was paid, that I had experienced the future. I knew it at that moment. I didn't entirely understand why it worked or how it worked, but I knew it worked. And I truly did stand up and do a dance around my dining room table. Because to me, to break up the government's money monopoly would be the single greatest thing that ever happened to human liberty in this whole world. I mean, you know, why do we have big government? Because of the Fed. You know, you give anybody a blank check, and that's what the Fed does to the government. It gives them a blank check, and they're going to spend They always talk about controlling the budget. They'll never control the budget until we get rid of the Fed. Um, when I think about all the people in the world who have so much talent but are unbanked because of this big cartelized arrangement whose talents are not being used, Bitcoin can solve that problem. Uh, uh, if you're trapped in a country with, um, with a, a, f a failing money like Argentina or Venezuela, <coughs> Bitcoin can solve your problems. You can get your money out. And it is solving those problems every day. We don't hear a lot about it in this country, but if you lived in Argentina and you were selling an apartment, you would definitely sell for Bitcoin. And you can go online right now and see all the apartments and housing in Argentina is for sale in Bitcoin, priced in Bitcoin. And all around the world, I, it was a fad, funny thing happened to me in New Zealand. I wanted to take a helicopter ride and I saw they accepted Bitcoin. So I, uh, um, just checking my time here, we're almost out. Um, so 
I saw, oh, you, st- you take Bitcoin, that's wonderful. And so I went to my, com- my, my cell phone and I converted Bitcoin to New Zealand dollars. And then I converted New Zealand dollars back into US dollars. And then I converted uh, US dollars back into Bitcoin. And what do you know is the same price, <laughs> right? I, I had forgotten uh, something really incredible about this currency, namely that it is a global currency. It doesn't belong to one nation. It's for all people. So in, mo- in other words, it works just like gold did, you know, in the, uh, the, in the late Middle Ages, all the way through the 19th century, a global currency. People used to criticize Bitcoin for being volatile. It hasn't been volatile for 18 months. It's, it's been stuck, more or less, around $250. But that's been an awesome thing, because it's allowed many wonderful developers around the world to uh, build an infrastructure around it. Now you've got every big Wall Street firm interested in, in it and building structures around the blockchain, which isn't just about money. It's about any kind of information porting. So if you can commodify and bundle a piece of information, you can put it on the blockchain and it'll make it immutable and uh, create a perfect record of that. And I'm talking about titles, uh, marriage certificates, stock ownership, you name it, anything. You, you see how revolutionary potentially this is. So we're living amidst this firmament. This is going on right now. It's just a matter of time. Uh, uh, there's no way our existing financial structures can possibly sustain themselves in light of competition from Bitcoin. When is it going to happen? I don't know. Uh, Within the next five years, next ten years, I don't know. It took email about 18 years from going from from, uh, just a tool for geeks to something that um, your parents use, you know, every day. So I don't know that it's going to take that long for Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is real. It's the newest iteration of peer-to-peer technology, and it's the thing we've really needed to, to finally complete this great migration that we've been going through over the last 20 years, where we, we used to just live a purely physical existence, and evermore we're living now in the age of information, a migration out of the physical world into this beautiful digital cloud that's more and more freeing people from governments. That's what I'm most excited about. So for me, I love the technology, yes, but more than anything else in this world, I love human liberty. That is what's beautiful. That's what you know, animates my heart. That's what I fell in love with when I was, uh, when I was in college. And when I see a technology that comes along that can make people freer, um, I get inspired and I want to work for it. And it encourages me and it helps me look towards the the future and know that it is going to be brighter than the present. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, I recently read that the New York State uh, regulator for financial affairs has approved bitcoins in that, uh, for that state. Uh, I was wondering, will that have a significant impact on uh, uh, perhaps speeding up the uh, uh, use of bitcoins across the country because I think the New York regulators are kind of a model for the other 49 states. Yeah, and it was a particular problem. Uh, you know, the question concerns whether the New York, or you called it approval, but really it's regulation of bitcoin is going to help or hurt. The initial iteration of that law was devastating, and many bitcoin companies were promising to move out of New York uh, because they were trying to make bitcoin work like the dollar, you know, with know your customer rules and all sorts of regulatory um, uh, strictures, and it really wasn't plausible. But the Bitcoin community really lobbied hard and made the legislation better. Uh, There's still a lot of contention and the legislation isn't final. But one of the problems that Bitcoin has had is that we, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing that, you know, it wasn't invented by the Senate Banking Committee. It didn't come out of the Federal Reserve. It didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't emerge out of a, a, a journal, of uh, establishment journal, you know. It, it was invented by an anonymous nerd somewhere, and we don't know his name. So it's always kind of existed under a cloud of uncertainty. So lots of Bitcoiners are very interested in having governments uh, approve of Bitcoin, if for no other reason than it removes the uncertainty concerning how they're going to be treated by tax law and, and by the financial regulators. So, um, so I have very mixed feelings about it. On one hand, I really don't think Bitcoin needs any regulation at all. Or, or another way to put it is I don't think it needs government regulation. It regulates itself. On the other hand, we live in a world where government's approval of things is important for things like 
um, venture funding of uh, ca capital for, for new enterprises. So in that sense, I think probably government recognition of Bitcoin uh, could, could be helpful. We also need to remember that it's not just Bitcoin. This is an open source protocol. There are really thousands, even tens of thousands of other coins that are out there, Litecoin and, and Darkcoin and Dogecoin, which is one of my favorite. It started off as a joke. You know, based on an internet meme, now it's the tipping currency of the internet. I collect it all the time. You know, so there are many, many cryptocurrencies out there uh, because it's such a fabulous technology. So they can regulate Bitcoin. If they overregulate it, you'll just see movement into other kinds of cryptocurrencies. Uh, I don't believe that currency will ever again be trapped in the hands of unelected bureaucrats and monopoly situations. Bitcoin is doing to money what Uber did to the New York taxicab monopolies, for example. I mean, just that's that's the way peer-to-peer -peer technology works. Very good, right here. Your last statement is perfect. Uh, unelected bureaucrats and their impact on the money uh, could be very important, and that uh, relates to my question. Title 18 of the Code of Federal Regulations deals with currency, and Section 486 uh, explicitly prohibits the use of physical metal currencies that are, uh, even if they're totally dissimilar to, to our own currency, not, not any intention to be a counterfeit, they're just different. Um, do you have any concern about the possibility that some rogue regulator would make that, uh, make an amendment to that title and say this extends to virtual currencies as well? Uh, I think that they could attempt that, but uh, it's, it's not possible. You know, government, uh, the government does a lot of things that are actually not achievable. Um, uh, like they prohibit 20-year-olds from drinking, for example. It hasn't worked out too well. Um, <laughs> right, so... Uh, so the Department of Education could abolish algebra, you know, too. Uh, but it's not going to take it away from us, and it's a similar thing with cryptocurrency. They can, they can, they can slow us down, but they can't stop it at this point. Uh, once a technology on this scale, uh, at this level of usefulness uh, appears in the world, um, there's nothing governments can do to stop it. Uh, they can slow it down, but they can't stop it. In my early time of life, there was the one world the one world people you know that wanted everything controlled by one world government and yada yada how and so like they they're trying to do with the currency maybe how is this not going you mentioned globally how is this not going to be controlled by i don't know who I mean, how, yeah. how is it safe from the one world? Anymore? Well, that's the beautiful thing. It's not owned by anyone, anybody in particular. It's, it's a little bit difficult to understand that, that Bitcoin is not a private company. Um, there's not a, a, just a small group of people who own it and run it. it it's, a, it's a technology that belongs to the world. It lives on a distributed network, and the protocol itself is open to the whole world, and anybody can work on it. It's kind of like a Wikipedia for money or uh, WordPress as a, a software technology. It belongs to everybody, so there's no central point of failure. Uh, the blockchain is forever. Uh, there are uh, millions and really billions of copies of the blockchain, identical copies out there. And you could, you could, you could set the UN to, to uh, you know, invade the world and try to destroy it. So long as one copy uh, continues to exist, it can be replicated a trillion times over within 24 hours. So that's a pretty awesome thing. Uh, there's, there's, there's simply no way it can be controlled by, by governments. And this was by design. Satoshi set it up this way. He had seen, himself, had seen many attempts to create alternative forms of money that came crashing down because they had central points of failure. I, I don't know if you know this very interesting man named Bernard von Nothaus. He had made a, uh, a silver uh, kind of token that he called the Liberty Dollar. Uh, this was in the 1980s. And uh, a very interesting thing, as soon as it started to, to take off and be, become an alternative currency, um, you know, the feds, the feds shut him down. They went in and confiscated all of his, his money and, and uh, arrested him, put him in jail, put him through a trial. He got declared uh, uh, 
uh, guilty. He was never actually sentenced, which is a fascinating thing. And, and now all the, all the silver has been returned uh, to, the, to its owners all these years later. But Satoshi was watching this and said, you know, whatever I create, I need to make it invulnerable to that kind of bureaucratic harassment. And, and that's essentially what he did. So uh, I, I'm very encouraged by this. I mean, it's too bad you have to go to the, these links. We really should have a system like we originally had in this country, which is all monies were allowed. Anybody who uh, wanted to make a money can just make a money. I mean, that's, in 1830, most of the coins that circulated in this country were foreign coins. Uh, uh, they were just silver with different, uh, different labels on them. Uh, money competition is as important as restaurant competition or tennis shoe competition or anything else. We need competition in money, but the government hasn't allowed it. They want only one money, and they want that to be the dollar because they control that. Bitcoin almost miraculously has outsmarted some of the smartest people in the world. It's very exciting. We on the gold standard, and one of the problems was that gold fluctuated. Uh, and quantity and so forth, so the money is fluctuating. Now we have the Federal Reserve fluctuating the money. Who controls or what controls the Bitcoin? This is one of the, the question is who controls the value of Bitcoin? That's one of the things that alarms people about Bitcoin is that the answer is nobody. Or another way to put it is that everybody does. So it's, it's just, it, it fluctuates in value as any physical thing does. Uh, the price of wine, the price of paintings, oil, we all know real estate. Anything that's subject to the market is going to be uh, fluctuate according to supply and demand. The thing that's wonderful about Bitcoin that, that I love about it is that the supply of Bitcoin is absolutely known and fixed. There are 25 new Bitcoin released every 10 minutes under the current uh, protocol. And you can know this for sure. And you know exactly how many are out there. And you know. Uh, exactly the public addresses of all the owners of existing Bitcoin. That's an amazing thing. I mean, not even the Federal Reserve knows how many dollars there are. You know why they have all these different measures of money, MZM, M1, M2, M3, M4, you know, seasonal adjustments of this and that, because they don't know. And they keep having to come up with new forms of measuring the money because nobody really knows how much there is. With Bitcoin, you know precisely how many there are, and that's wonderful. So yes, you can't know what the value of Bitcoin um, will be in five years, but you can know exactly how many will exist in the world. And I think that's a big step up over existing currency. With regard to the value of Bitcoin down the road, you just said you really can't predict it. But on the other hand, you are anticipating much more demand for Bitcoin, like it really could explode. So yeah. Supply and demand. Uh, why would you not be saying that you would anticipate a huge rise? In well, why am I not saying? Well, why am I not uh, saying that I anticipate a huge rise? Well, because um, I, I had perfectly predicted uh, when Bitcoin reached a thousand dollars, almost to the day. And that was an awesome experience in my life. Um, and also the worst thing that can ever happen to a public intellectual, to be right about something. Because I, I, <laughs> I thought at that moment that I had superior insight. And I was very wrong. I should have shut up at that point, you know, because I anticipated it going higher and higher at that point. And, and of course, it, it, it stabilized at about $250. So I'm a little reluctant to predict. But of course, all things equal, we can anticipate a much higher exchange rate uh, of Bitcoin to the dollar in the future, uh, given increased circulation and popularity of the coin. Now, I, I'm really excited about what this can mean for, for economic life to live under what would, in effect, be deflationary conditions. Or another way to put it is a, a money that actually grows in value over time. Can you imagine such a thing? That would change our culture completely. Reward saviors, you know? How about that? Y your, money, your money grows in value as you save it. I mean, wouldn't that be an awesome thing? Maybe we'd start thinking a little bit more long term. Young people would start to uh, think twice before spending all their money on, uh, on silly things. I think it would have a huge cultural impact. We're used to the dollar just going down in value, which is one of the reasons we're so in uh, such great debt. People are rewarded for getting rid of their, their money. Uh, in other words, rewarded for being irresponsible. That's what the current system does. So a new money system that would be 
deflationary would actually reward you for being responsible. I think that would be a remarkable thing. That's what happened in the late 19th century. Late 19th century, we experienced a constantly rising uh, value of money, uh, which is another way of saying constantly falling prices. And we also experienced economic growth on a level that we don't even know anything about today. We're talking about, you know, nine, 10, 13 percent levels of economic annual GDP growth. Can you imagine what that would feel like? Uh, that would be an awesome thing. So uh, deflationary monetary systems go together with growing economies. I mean, don't listen to Paul Krugman, all right? So like this guy doesn't, I don't understand. I mean, he has a Nobel Prize, but that doesn't mean he knows anything, actually. He's uh, completely wrong about, about everything, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, two things real quick. Is there such a thing as an Uber for small airplanes? Think about that, and then I have a Bitcoin question <coughs> above all. Yeah, I, you know, that's an intriguing question. I don't know the answer to it. There might be, and if there's not, you might have just given some very smart people in this room a very good idea. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now, Bitcoin is a medium of exchange. We all understand that. Uh, in the early days of the country, the reason we call a dollar a buck is because they used to exchange Box skins, you had box and doles. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's, why a box, that's why a dollar's a box, because it was a skin of a box. Now, at some point, somebody had to hunt that, and they, they got the, the value of it because they captured the buck and they skinned the deer. Who gets the first medium of exchange on the Bitcoin? And now you answered my supply question. You have to have control of the supply. You said so much is coming out per hour or whatever. Yeah, who gets it first? Yeah, who's, who's the first one yeah. who benefits from that first uh, in, the, uh, in Bitcoin language, they're called the miners. Um, that's, just, uh, that's just to remind you of, of like gold mining, the people who enter the mine first with the pickaxes, whatever you find you keep. In, in the Bitcoin world, if you volunteer your, your CPU power of your computer to verifying transactions, you're rewarded. Uh, for your public service by being the first owners of the new Bitcoin that comes out. And about five years ago, if you were a miner, then you could get very rich. Now mining tends to take place in very large consortiums that exist in places where electricity is as cheap as possible. So uh, the big mining rigs are now in China and uh, Iceland and other very strange places, but they're not typically in, in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, but even a few years ago, uh, uh, college kids could mine Bitcoin and, and make a lot of money. I had a friend who set up mining rigs in his home, in his, in his dorm room. And, uh, you know, he had computers all over the walls and they're all mining Bitcoin. It got very hot, so he had to buy fans, and he had to buy an extra air conditioner. And, and pretty soon, it wasn't his dorm room, it was an apartment. And uh, his electricity bill um, came one month and it was uh, something like $600. And uh, which wasn't a problem to him. He was happy to pay it because he was making a lot more than that, mining Bitcoin. But the police came and, uh, and uh, they knocked on the door and said, we've got a problem because your electrical bill is just really out of hand and it made us suspicious of what's going on here. He said, well, you are, I, I gather he thought he was growing uh, marijuana, right? Um, because those, I guess those lights are expensive or something. But he invited him in and he said, what the hell is going on right here? <laughs> And he said, oh, all these computers are solving math problems. I'm a math major. S which was true. And so the police said, well, OK then. Thank you very much, and left. And that was <laughs> very, st very strange. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's really uh, intriguing and interesting to find out more. Um, I just have a question of trying to kind of understand um, the Bitcoin and the currency. And I'm just curious, when you say it's valued at an um, exchange of $2, $250 to a Bitcoin, yes. what you say right there. Um, let's, say you, but let's say you want to buy a pair of pliers or something. Um, is there like a, a smaller, you, you know, you want to pay $200? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Yes, okay, th that's a good question. This is one of the reasons, one of the, one of the features that money has to have is divisibility. Um, this is one of the reasons that, uh, like chickens don't work well as money, or uh, that's another, I mean, you can think of many things that are not vis divisible, right? Um, uh, but, and so gold and silver came to be money because you can slice it up into ever smaller units. So Bitcoin can be sliced up into uh, 
Uh, I, uh, can somebody help me out? Is it 12th or 14th? Yeah, the Satoshi is the smallest, but is that... Okay, so how many decimal places is that? Okay, 12, 14, 16. So, yeah, so it, it's divisible uh, t to such an extent. The other thing is that, like, if, if Bitcoin became uh, $10 million a coin, then you might have to add decimal places, and, and since it's an open source protocol, you can do that. You know, it's funny. The Bitcoin community is, is funny because it is open source, and, and what that means is that everybody has to argue about everything. You know, it's the ultimate committee, you know, you can imagine. So there's a big controversy right now of expanding the blockchain size to accommodate all the new demands for, for adding uh, new forms of information to exchange units. And the Bitcoin community has been arguing just bitterly now for four months. I, I used to pay attention to these arguments all the time. Now I just find them boring. But, but the, the press always discovers these things. They find out about these controversies on Bitcoin. And they, and they always say the same thing. They run headlines, you know, uh, Bitcoin's in deep trouble, you know. Uh, Bitcoin is biting the dust, uh, you know, divisions, arguments, and acrimony dividing the Bitcoin community. Well, yes, and may it always be so, you know. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. Anybody can, can, can become a Bitcoin pundit and weigh in on what you think should happen to the size of the blockchain. That's a beautiful thing. I'd much rather have that system than have 12 big shots meeting in a, in a secret room uh, like they do at the Federal Reserve to determine our fate. So, as I understand, it's possible for this money to exist on your phone, and what happens if you drop your phone in the toilet or <laughs> Um, Yeah, that's never a good idea to drop your phone in a toilet. But um, the, 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 the important thing, um, uh, so many aspects of Bitcoin are purely metaphorical. So we call the thing that you hold your Bitcoin in a wallet. But it's not really a wallet. What it is, is a, a storage unit of your private key. So if there's another way to access that private key, then um, you can drop your phone in the wallet. And, and if for one thing, you can memorize it. You write it down on a piece of paper. Um, uh, you can download, uh, like in my case, I keep, I keep several copies of, well, I keep Bitcoin in many different storage units around, cold, hot, whatever. And I always have redundancy to make sure that I can always access it. The other thing you can do, people say this, well, I wouldn't trust a, a, a digital money, uh, something that exists in the cloud. I, I, I want something real. Ron Paul said this to me. He said, real money, you have to be able to feel and touch. Well, there's an easy answer to this with Bitcoin. You just print it out. I mean, you can do this. You just print it out and leave it in a safe. Uh, and uh, on, that, on the pieces of paper are your QR codes. They give you... Said that. Yeah, Ron Paul said that. Yeah. That's the biggest joke today. Oh, uh, what? Oh, with that, that he said that. Well, I mean, I kind of got. I kind of get it. I mean, there have to be people in this room that think I'm crazy. Uh, it's got to be because it's, it's an implausible idea, and uh, it's not something that ever existed. I mean, for for example. None of us have ever thought before, five years ago, that we could have a payment system and a money that's one and the same. We've never really understood that before. We've always thought Visa as the payment system, PayPal as a payment system, ACH as a payment system, and a money as the dollar. These are separate. But in the Bitcoin protocol, these are one and the same. It's very difficult to think through this. And for my part, it took me you know, basically a year worth of study you know, and reading lots of books on cryptography and, you know, everything to finally get it. I believed in Bitcoin before I even understood it. Uh, and in the future, it won't be necessary to understand Bitcoin any more than it's important to understand how the lights in this room work. You just know to turn a switch on and they come on. And that's going to that's be what it's like in the future. But for now, we live in a time of incredulity towards this technology because it's, it is difficult to understand. His question reminds me of the guy that threw away his computer and it was in the dump so many feet because Bitcoin was worth nothing and he threw it. Do you remember that story? Yeah, I do. Yeah, this was because um, he had uh, the full, the original Satoshi Protocol uh, wallet on his computer and had downloaded the entire blockchain on that computer. So yeah, when that's destroyed, he lost access to it. So he had not taken the, the right levels of uh, uh, security. Yeah, you live and learn. Right. What can I say? Oh. You know. Next, next 
Jeff, you've written a lot about young people. And when you were last year in Wichita, it was last year about this time, you were the keynote speaker mm -hmm. for the statewide conference of Students for Liberty. Yeah. We in Wichita are told all the time that we've got to do something to attract and retain young people, the millennials in particular. And it seems like everybody's looking for a government situation. What advice would you have for us as a city to attract and retain young entrepreneurial people? I mean, the answer comes down to one word, freedom. Right? The more freedom you give people, the more they're attracted to what you do. So, you know, what that looks like uh, in practice, it can be many, many things. Repealing uh, occupational licensure. You know, uh, 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 cities are very famous for, for wanting to license everybody for everything. Well, this hurts employment. Um, becoming Bitcoin friendly would just, it would just be awesome. Uh, permitting more and more peer-to-peer -peer technologies. I, th I gather there's some controversy about Uber right here in Wichita, which is uh, amazing to me. Uh, but being open to more Airbnb and, and Jackrabbit style services and, and letting the apps uh, you know, be a place for entrepreneurship for application developers. Uh, this is the best thing that Wichita could ever do. Um, on, you know, only enterprise saves cities. Only enterprise grows cities. Only enterprise lifts the human spirit. Governments just can't do that. So. From a perspective of somebody who is using lots of B, uh, P2P stuff, um, I was with a lot of friends that were the original miners and made some deals on that, whatever. But one of them has fake said that there's controversy going on now that somebody with a quantum <coughs> processor, which some people don't know what that means, could possibly become the Fed's uh, printing press, so to speak, and turn out Bitcoin even and break the blockchain, so to speak. Yeah. Have you Oh, sure. I mean, the quantum could be... Uh, Bitcoin's funny because it attracts debunkers no matter what. And one of the lines you hear is that when quantum computing comes, uh, comes along, that the protocol will not uh, sustain itself. But uh, all the programmers I talk to just laugh at this and say that this is not true, that when quantum computing comes along, it's just a tweak in the code and, and, and everything's going to be perfectly fine. So I've, I've, I'm completely reassured in that, re uh, that respect. Uh, you know, uh, that's the great thing about, about Bitcoin is that it adapts to change. Uh, and the dollar uh, really doesn't adapt to change. And we're still using payment systems from the 1950s. My father's, my father, uh, who died uh, 10 years ago, uh, his first professional job was working for, um, for MasterCard, you know? I mean, this is, a, this is a very ancient technology. And it needs to be vastly upgraded. And Bitcoin is that upgrade, I think. Okay, last question. Uh, right Jeffrey, uh, many, well, many of us in this room are familiar with the role that the Foundation for Economic Education played in the past. Would you give us some idea of, of uh, thank you. your role? Well, thank you for yeah, thank you for that question. So, yeah, I do work for FEE. You know, a FEE, FEE was found, Foundation for Economic Education, was founded right after World War II. These were dark times, you know. Um, everybody was panicked about returning soldiers. Oh, they're going to drive down wages. We're going to go into recession. What are we going to do about all the wage and price controls? Can we really repeal them? Uh, there was a great uh, panic on the part of many government programs you know, that, had, that had thrived during the world. Mainly, uh, nobody believed in free enterprise. Uh, I gather. But one man, Leonard Reed, founded this thing called the Foundation for Economic Education that set out to change the culture. And they began to print publications and distribute them widely without copyright uh, to everybody to, to help educate and inspire a new generation to believe in the American system of free enterprise and, and human liberty. And he made a gigantic difference. He died in early 1973 and the foundation has continued to exist. But um, my good friend Larry Reed, who's no relationship to Leonard, took it over in, in 2008 and really saved the institution. And I came on board within the last year. And I see awesome potential uh, for the Foundation for Economic Education to enter into a new kind of um, influence in the world today. Um, and, and it goes like this, basically. Uh, in the internet age, uh, kids, the millennials, they're not reading uh, 1,000 page treatises like I did, you know. Uh, they're not getting their news from the New York Times. Uh, they don't pay that much attention to what their professors say. Academia is losing influence. 
the way their ideas are shaped are through vehicles of public opinion that, that are commenting on world affairs all around them. Uh, the publications that come to mind for me are like BuzzFeed. These are, this is where people get their news. BuzzFeed and Slate and Salon and The New Yorker and The Atlantic. They're all very high-level, well-written, beautiful publications that engage people right where they are. Um, but as I look at all those publications, I don't see a lot of friendliness to the idea of freedom in them. Um, most all of them are written from the point of view of a, uh, a belief that government can solve all of our problems. And I'm very worried about this because this is, they're very compelling. And I think those of us on my side of, of, of politics have failed to enter into this realm. We don't have a single uh, publication or institution that, that can compete anywhere close to it. Well, last year I came on board and I tried every trick I, I could. And um, I just about tripled the traffic to the Foundation's uh, website. Now we're getting about 25,000 visitors a day. And I'm happy about that. That's pretty darn awesome. That puts us in maybe the top five in the world um, in terms of uh, distributing liberty-minded uh, ideas. But I'm not going to be happy until we add a one or two zeros to that. And I think we can do it. We have the tools, we have the technology, we have the minds. What FEE really lacks right now is a good financial infrastructure to support the kind of development I want to do. So one of my jobs that I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in right now is uh, trying to inspire people to have some confidence in us going forward. I think we can change the world. You know, peer-to-peer -peer technology is beautiful, and, but it's not going to bring us freedom automatically. I don't believe that you can really have a free society unless people really believe in the idea of a free society. And that takes inspiration and education and leadership. I think FEE can provide that in the future. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.